We're going to get started right now with Mr. Keith James. Keith? At least there are a lot of friends in the room. As most of you know, I do not belong on stage. <laughs> That's where my wife lives. Um, but I've been asked to talk a little bit about how this all happened. You all know Jack Rouse Associates, or at least most of you do. If not, we have a website and you can go see what we do. But I was asked to talk a little bit about how I got here. Um, I am absolutely the most unprepared person to have ever had such a lucky life. Um, I will try to tie in some stories along the way that will make sense to you as we, as we go. But I was a, an athlete as a kid. This will make sense in a, in a minute. I swam three to four miles a day, seven days a week for 10 years. Um, it was fun, it was great, but when it was over, it was over, and all of a sudden you realize that if your name wasn't Mark Spitz or now Michael Phelps, there really was no life after swimming. So I was a senior in high school, a useless student. I was a good athlete, but a terrible student. Um, and I ended up, the Cincinnati Marlins, by the way, was the swim team, okay? Um, I swam on a high school team, I swam on a, <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> high school team, a YMCA team, a summer team, and the Marlins, and so basically I was in the water all the time. Um, but when I finished swimming, I really didn't know what to do, and my grades sucked, so I apologize if I offend anybody with my language. But I got very lucky because my mother worked at the University of Cincinnati. And she had this amazing boss who I got to know extremely well. And most of you know him, his name is Jack Rouse. So she was his secretary and that's how all of this began. I had no future, no ideas, no desires or whatever, but Jack taught me how to ride, ride a motorcycle. And so in the summer of 1970, when I graduated from high school, I spent 10 weeks, most of you will not believe this, but I spent 10 weeks riding around the United States on a motorcycle, living in a tent. <laughs> now, most of you know I like five-star hotels and I love good meals and I love alcohol and all of the, the other things that go with it, but I really did. I left home on July 10th, 1970 with $650 in my pocket and a credit card for gas and I came back the end of September, right before I went to the University of Cincinnati, and I still had money left. Now, it's not uncommon for me now to spend more than that on a dinner. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I met Jack. There were a couple of anecdotes about that trip that you should know. One of these stories I can never get through without crying, so I apologize. No, it's a serious, it's a serious story. I learned on that trip a lot, just about life in general and living in tents and making my own meals, which I had never had to do before and so forth and so on. But I had an experience at the Grand Canyon um, and it taught me to never take anything for granted, which I hope none of you ever take anything for granted. There's a wonderful glass walkway at the Grand Canyon now. Some of you probably worked on it for all I know. Well, I have a photograph taken from that same location in the summer of, give me a minute, I will get through this story. Um, from that same location in 1970. You know, you're sitting here in amazement in front of one of the seven wonders of the world, looking over this incredible thing, taking for granted everything that you have. There was a dad behind me, explaining what he was looking at. And I didn't understand that. And he was explaining it to his son. 
and here I am, a kid from Cincinnati, not a care in the world, a motorcycle that my parents helped me pay for, and so forth and so on. And I turned around. He was telling him what it was because the child was blind. I will never forget that um, as long as I live. So it just, it taught between that and my mother, it's never take anything for granted, never tell a lie. If you tell a lie, then you have to remember what it was. If you tell the truth, you don't have to worry. But, you know, those are the sorts of things that went on. Well, anyway, I got back from the motorcycle trip, and I was a shitty student, but I was a resident of Cincinnati, so I got to go to the University of Cincinnati, and I didn't want to go to Vietnam. <laughs> so I went to school. I went to college. And kind of rambled through my freshman year in college, and it, was, it really wasn't very good but I got a chance to work in the theater. I needed money. And all of this was, how do I pay for college? Well, at the end of that year, Jack and his associates decided to put together a musical theater and a technical theater program at the University of Cincinnati, which, by the way, is now the longest running musical theater program in the United States and one of the most successful. And they needed a guinea pig to work on the technical theater department. Well, guess what? I was the guinea pig. I almost failed out of college my freshman year. I graduated as a senior on the dean's list because all of a sudden I found something that I really enjoyed. I have never been on stage. As you know, I don't like it up here. <laughs> uh, but I, don't, I work behind the scenes and always have. Well, anyway, the University of Cincinnati, the CCM, that's where Patty, many of you know my wife, Patty, she teaches there now. Um, and she's a choreographer. That's why she's not here today. She'll be here tomorrow, and he'll be here on Saturday night. There was this little thing being built north of Cincinnati called Kings Island. Okay, I was training to be a stage manager. They were going to have an entertainment department. Okay. The entertainment department was being put together by two gentlemen, one named Jack Rouse and the other one named Carmen de Leon. I said, well, guys, do you need a stage manager or a production stage manager or whatever? They said, sure. So I got this job in November of 1971 as a stage manager at Kings Island. I met this very tall, attractive lady at an audition in November of 1971. We're still married. Um, you, many of you know her, as I said. But that's how that part all started. I went to Kings Island to work because I needed to pay for college. And what happened to me the first season in 1972 is the day after the park opened, Jack and his wife Mo decided to go to Acapulco on vacation. Carmen, who is, remains a dear friend, but he's a conductor. He's a classical music and musical conductor. He conducts the ballet in Cincinnati, he didn't want to be in this pop business, so he quit. Okay, so Jack's in Acapulco, and Carmen quit, and I'm a stage manager, and I'm 19. Actually, 20 by then. I said, okay, now what happens? Well, Jack was gone for two and a half weeks, Carmen was gone, um, and the department did not fall apart. So it was one of those things I said, well, okay, Yes, I can do this. I didn't know I couldn't, so I might as well say yes. And so that's how all of this started for me. I just needed a summer job to pay for college. This was not a career path. I went to college to essentially avoid the draft, um, and then got into the theater program and decided I wanted to be a producer and expected to go to New York or Hollywood. And I ended up working at a theme park in Cincinnati and as they say, the rest is history. But let me, let me run through a couple of these other steps. Taft Broadcasting, for any of you who don't know, was the company that originally owned Kings Island and Kings Dominion and Carowinds. It later became Kings Entertainment. It was later bought by Paramount. It's now part of Cedar Fair. So that, that whole history, and there, there are other steps along the way that uh, really wouldn't make much sense to anybody, but Taft Broadcasting had bought a park on the Ohio River called Coney Island, 
which was family owned by the Waxes and the Shots, tremendously successful. Uh, actually, check number one from Disneyland is on the wall in the lobby at Kings Island because Gary Wax and Ed Schott were the consultants who, along with Buzz Price, tried to convince Walt not to build this. Okay. <laughs> so, so, anyway, I've seen the check. It's, it's for real. I met Patty at Kings Island. We, uh, yeah, I'd never seen anybody with such long legs and such a, being such a good dancer. And so she wondered after a while, why does this guy just keep, come, keep coming to my shows and hanging around and watching? Well, eventually I got the nerve up to propose. And seven years later we got married, but as she will tell you, we only got married because I got transferred to Toronto. Otherwise, we'd still be dating. <laughs> Sorry, Chloe. <laughs> uh, King's Productions was a group that was put together that is now, um, well, it was put together in the early 70s because uh, Taft decided they wanted to do more parks. King's Dominion was the park in Richmond. Part of it opened in 75, most of it opened in 76. King's Productions was a group that produced all the entertainment for both parks, and we did all the design work. Somewhere along that period, Carowinds had been built by Duke Power, a fellow by the name of Pat Hall, who was a very wealthy, eccentric entrepreneur in Charlotte. We bought that park. Um, so they had started to put things together. I kind of got myself a little bit out of sequence here. In 1979, actually in 78, a gentleman by the name of Mike Bartlett, who many of you in the room or some of you in the room may know, he was an executive with the Taft Broadcasting Company. He was asked to be president of Canada's Wonderland in Toronto. And there was kind of a love-hate relationship between the design group and the operating group. And since I was in the design group, but Mike liked me, he said, will you move to Toronto and manage the designers because I don't want to. So I ended up moving to Toronto in January of 1979 and was lucky enough to be head of planning and development for Canada's Wonderland and subsequently the park manager for that park for the first two seasons. Anyway, that and going back to the swimming and all the way through, but especially Canada's Wonderland, uh, 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 going, looking back for a second, one thing on the swimming that you need to understand, I was pretty good, but our relays were great. We actually, if you go back in the record books, probably the late 60s, my name might be in, in junior Olympic records and things like that, but as a relay member, not as an individual. I learned early on that you better prop yourself up with people better than you. You know, that is how it all works. Find the best you can and let them do what they do and be there to defend them if something goes haywire and let them get the credit if everything goes well. Well, I learned that when I was a swimmer because we all got to stand on the blocks and get the trophies. But Canada's Wonderland, and I don't know if there are any, I'm, I'm pretty old, but there may be some Wonderland people in the room. That was a family. That's still a family. We, uh, there was a party at one of the IAPAs a number of years ago hosted by Management Resources where they had everybody who had ever worked with Mike Bartlett stand up in the room, and there were 65 of us. It's now many of us from JRA, many from Forec, many from uh, probably with Anthony's group. Um, all over the planet, we kind of populated everything. Management resources, I met those guys in 79 because they came and helped with the park. So the, the roots go deep there. Anyway, all of that, the King's Productions, King's Entertainment is what the company eventually became named when the management bought the parks from Taft Broadcasting. That was the family that I grew up with. The Expo 86 is in there for a second. I had the privilege of being VP of Operations for the World's Fair in 1986 in Vancouver. But the real reason that we met, moved to Vancouver was to have our daughter Alexis, Chloe's older sister. Uh, Mike Bartlett became president of that project and he called me and said, you wanna move to Vancouver? I don't know what you're gonna do. 
I don't know where I got, how we're going to put this together, but I need your help. So we moved. Patty was pregnant, or we were pregnant, I suppose, but she was the one, she, she was the one doing all the work. Um, and so I went out there, but I didn't stay very long because another gentleman by the name of Jack Rouse came and visited me in April. Patty was two weeks overdue. Jack and I had decided to go to Whistler skiing. <laughs> Patty was two weeks overdue at the lounge at the bottom of the mountain. She would have skied if we would have let her. And people were walking by saying, oh my God, what's going to happen? Is she going to deliver right here? Anyway, Jack said, would you ever consider coming back? Two weeks later, Nelson Schwab, who many of you in the room may know also, came to Vancouver and said, we have a job in Australia. Would you be interested? So I was only in Vancouver for six months. Then I spent from June to May of, the, of 1983, 84, commuting between Cincinnati and Sydney. And I went there to work with a company called Australia's Wonderland. We put together a park there. It did not do very well. Eventually it was sold, but the real estate value was about 10 times what it was when we bought it. So ultimately it was a success, maybe not an operating success, but somebody made a hell of a lot of money. But that string together all the way to Australia was terrific. That was a family too. But I will say the most important thing that ever happened to us while we were in Australia is the young lady sitting back there. Yep. Lexi's a Canadian, Chloe's an Australian. So, and Patty and I are both from Cincinnati suburbs. So, um, that gets you to 1987. It started in November of 71. So, yeah, I will have my 45th anniversary in this business on November 11th, right before IAPA, I have a letter written to me by Gary Wax, Denny Spiegel, and Jack Rouse that says, would you like to work, not would you like, we're offering you a job at Kings Island as a stage manager. I said, okay. Well, I got to Australia. I was, we were there two years for it to be developed, two years for it to operate. I need to back up here for a couple of seconds just to acknowledge a couple of other people. King's Productions, which was the group that we put together, I met a young man who actually is in the audience also, who, <laughs> who was a co-op student because his other co-op job fell through. His name is Dan Schultz. He's sitting back there. Poor son of a bitch. <laughs> 1975, he came to work with us as a co-op. Dan is the COO of Jack Rouse Associates. We've been together 40 plus, 40 plus years. In Canada's Wonderland, I met a gentleman by the name of Peter Fitzgibbon who traveled around the world with me. Uh, to, to from, he lived in Toronto, still does. Uh, Canada, went to Australia, then I, took, uh, then I asked Fitz to go to Florida with me as well. That gets us to Universal which most everybody knows, but you may not know the fact that Mike Bartlett, who had taken me to Toronto, who had taken me to Vancouver, was a senior executive at Universal. I was in Sydney one Saturday afternoon in the park, the park was open, and I got this call out of the blue. I hadn't talked to Mike in years. And it was like a couple of the other phone calls. He said, I'm involved in this project in Orlando. I really don't know what we're doing. I certainly don't know what I'm doing, but would you mind moving to Florida? Uh, I was in Sydney. I was very happy in Sydney. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, I don't have a clue. He said, what, do you know how much you can pay me? No. Um, am I going to be working with anybody that I know? He said, me. I said, well, when would you like me there? He said, tomorrow. <laughs> so I was there in two weeks. And I spent four wonderful years in Orlando working for Universal Studios and Mike Bartlett. Now, that's a history that many people don't know. Most people know 
the JRA history, I rejoined Jack in 1992. Jack and Amy owned the company. They started in 1987. I rejoined them because they had gotten into corporate work. They had gotten out of the theme park work, and they wanted to get back into the entertainment work. And I happened to be home for Christmas, and I needed a hand, and Jack had a Porsche, so his car was much more fun to drive to Indianapolis than my car. So we drove to Indianapolis because he was going to help me out in a meeting with somebody who was building something on the White River in Indianapolis. And on the way there, he said, Amy and I miss the entertainment business. Would you consider, and come, consider coming to work with us? My contract with Universal was up. I said, sure, what, what do you want to do? He said, I haven't a clue. You know, we would like to get back into the theme park business. This was right before Christmas, 19... 91. I said, sure, when would you like me to come? He said, well, why do you need to go back to Orlando? I said, well, I have, to, I have two daughters in school and a wife who is, has a job and a house I have. He said, well, so what? Can you start next week? So January 1st or 6th or 5th or whatever it is, 1992, I became a partner at JRA with Jack and with Amy, bless her heart, I mean, I don't know that you know, my original partner, Amy, passed away last, uh, last February, like 14 months ago from cancer. But she and Jack had founded the company in 87, and I went back to work with them in 1992. But that, Patty said everybody be interested in that part. <laughs> you know, because that's how I got here. I, it was honest. I had no intentions of doing this. I didn't even know what the theme park business was. And candidly, when I got into the theme park business, there was the Magic Kingdom. Six Flags Texas was open. There was a tram tour at Universal. And none of the rest of it was here. I got very lucky. I needed a summer job. 45 years later, I still have that same summer job, but the industry has grown up. And fortunately for me, the industry has grown up underneath me. I've been the beneficiary of unbelievable experiences, unbelievable friendships, and that's how, it's, that's how my life started. That's how, it, how I got here. I wish I could tell you, and I don't know if you have many of the next gens here, I wish there was a plan. There wasn't. I was in the room a lot when people said, can you do this? The answer was always yes. I didn't have a clue how we were going to do any of it, but I had really, really good, really, really smart friends. And so once you leave the room and panic, and call your friends, then you say, okay, yeah, we can give this a go. Of course, at that point, we didn't know we couldn't, so what, what difference did it make? So, and that's how it, I, it, everything grew up. Now, is there, am I able, can I switch the slide? Okay. All right, I'm not, there you go. I, how did I do that? I didn't even. <laughs> anyway, this part, most of you know. This is about, I didn't want to overwhelm you with company slides. This is about 25% of the projects I've had the privilege to work on since I've been with JRA in 1992. Many of you recognize the logos. In fact, most of you in the room I've worked with in some capacity somewhere along the way. Um, now, that gets me to the real point and I know I have a lot of time left, but I really am much more comfortable talking and answering questions and things. But I am overwhelmed by this. Um, Chloe was with me, Salt Lake? We were in the Salt Lake Airport, which by the way, I spend a great deal of time in airports, as most of you know. And I got a call from a very, very good friend who's also in the audience, his name is Bob Ward, to let me know that I had been, that I was going to be receiving this award or this recognition. 
Chloe came up to me and said, because I was weeping, I was in absolute a mess in the Salt Lake City Airport, and she came up to me and said, we were on our way to somewhere for a charrette or a meeting or whatever. She said, do we need to go home? Are, are, are you sick? Are you all right? I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm okay. This is what just happened. And of course, then I immediately called Patty. But I was, I, it was the furthest thing from my mind because I have loved every minute of, sorry, of every day. But this recognition probably is, okay, now if I just touch it, it's gonna change again because that's what it did last time. Can you just, can, sorry, I'm, I'm, people don't let me touch equipment in my own office. See how well I did? Good. <laughs> Joe. Nevertheless, the, the, the point, there we go. I'm getting recognized for something that we deserve, not me. I've had an unbelievable career. By the way, I hope it's not over. Um, but it's been working with you all. I get to sit at the head of a chart, and I get to get, get to receive, or get to, or I do receive, a tremendous amount of credit for the work that you all do. Not that I do. This recognition goes to the, well, you saw the previous chart, the thousands and thousands of people that I've had the privilege of knowing and working with. 45 years, that's a lot of thousands. But I, I, that's why I was so humbled. It's kind of, you know, yeah, I've, I've been in the right place a lot of times. I've had a tremendous career, I've got unbelievable friends, and I've seen the entire world. Yes, somebody is going to ask me, I do have nine and a half million miles, okay? <laughs> and let's see, I brought this as a prop. That's this version of my passport, okay? But I, I have, have seen, I've seen the whole world, I don't take anything for granted anymore. I think you do when, maybe you do when you're young, but I certainly don't. I had the privilege of visiting the Great Wall of China last Saturday with someone who'd never seen it before. I'd been there half a dozen or eight times, and I can't say I was dreading it because I do love to go. It's a fantastic place. And this particular person was able to convince me to take the bobsled ride down from the top and as most of you know, I don't do rides. <laughs> but to see the Great Wall of China through Chloe's eyes for the first time, you say, oh my God, look at what we do. Look at what we get to do. Now, we built the bobsled ride. We would like to take credit for the wall, but we didn't get to do that. <laughs> but I think really this is the key to my career as we do this stuff. This stuff is so good because of us, but I think I really need to thank you for this recognition because I'm still overwhelmed by it. And anyway, that's really all I have other than questions that you may want to ask, but that gets you to today and that's my history and Patty said you'd be interested. So, uh. sorry. And I would be, and I, it looks like we got plenty of time. So, and we can take questions, or we're going to have coffee early, <laughs> or both. Sure. Um, my. My 
my question is about how you got in this industry, which I think, as most of us, is sort of just by accident. Yeah. But do you really feel that your early um, experiences with swimming and team building um, played an, a part of that? At the time, no. Because I don't think really when you're 20 you can figure that out because there's no perspective. The importance of the teams, I always knew because I may have gotten to be the anchor sometimes, but it's if the other three guys weren't every bit as good as I was, we wouldn't win. And that's kind of stayed with me all the way through. And, you know, I, and through our company and through the projects I've worked on, you know, find the best and let them do what they do and support them beyond anybody's wildest imagination. And so yeah, it goes back to that, but I wasn't that smart. Uh, you know, it's now I understand it, but then, no. It was, I, you know, once I got into the business and people were saying, can you do this? I knew the answer was always yes, because I could find somebody who really could do it. Wouldn't be me, but I could find somebody, either they could help me do it or they could do it and I could get credit. So, <laughs> but. I have one more question. Sure. You told the story about the, um, the father explaining the Grand Canyon yeah. to his son. Do you feel that back somewhere in your subconscious that experience has helped you with the storytelling aspects of the pro programs and projects you create? Absolutely, all the, all the time, because there is no way to really describe the Grand Canyon. But you have to come close especially if it's a father and a son, sorry, and the son who will never see it, never know. But you have an obligation to do the best you can because, you know, you can see things, you can hear things, you can smell things, but you can't necessarily feel them. And so how do you do what we do? Or how do we do what we do to make people cry, to make people laugh. You know, we, we get it at the movies, we get it at the theater. You don't want somebody to go out whistling the costumes after you've seen the show. You want them to leave weeping or clapping or whatever. And that's because you, we can, we can deal with this. We can all deal with this. This is really hard, but this is what's important. So, is that okay? I have, <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Hi, Chris. Keith. Congratulations. Hi. Kudos to you, really. Thank you, Chris. You've, you've experienced great success, obviously, and congratulations for that. But some of the biggest lessons we learn in life are the, the failures that we yeah. have. Is there a particular failure that you, or challenge perhaps, that you've experienced that really moved you to move on and grow as a professional? All the time. Um, big ones, the biggest one, and I acknowledged it a little bit here, is we built a park in Australia. And I was there, and I was the boss. Our research, and I'm, I don't say this to blame anyone, so please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. You had to read deep, deep, deep into the research to understand that people on the east side of Sydney are not going to go to the west side of Sydney. Now, I lived in Toronto, and you had the east of the Danforth, west of the Danforth. But it was not a wall. It was just people didn't know their way around. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm from the north, so I'm lucky. My wife is from the west side. I may be the only north side boy, still one of the very few north side boys, who can find their way around the west side of Cincinnati. Now, it's not a barrier, it's just a fact, and it's cute, and it's fun. Our, we did not interpret the research properly, so we built something, we spent a great deal of money, we tried for years to make it work, and fortunately, somebody made a lot of money on the land. So that was okay. As an operating entity, it was tough. Uh, 
many of you know Tim Fisher, who's the CEO of Village Roadshow. Well, Tim was my assistant in Australia, and he was strapped with continuing to try and make it work, and we were never able to. The thing that you learn by that is second guess everything. Not from the standpoint of being negative, but what if, what if, what if, what's our contingency, what's the alternative, and so forth and so on. And always ask yourself those questions. Now the answers may be wrong, but always ask yourself the questions. The rest of them, hey, I was there on opening day at Universal Studios and when it began. Bobby was there with me. I mean, we tried a lot of things that were prototypes and a lot of those things didn't work. Now, eventually, it became one of the, as you all know, because most of you work there, it has become one of the more successful companies in the world, in our industry. But I was there the day it wasn't. I was there, there the day there were a lot of executives sitting on the curb, curb scratching their heads saying, oh my God, what have we done? Now, fortunately, they had staying power, they outlasted it. Jay Stein, the visionary, who I didn't always get along with, but who I absolutely respect, he stuck with it until it all worked. So those, that, was, that one was short. The Australian project was a little bit more challenging because the only way out of it was to sell the land. And, it, and like I said, it's tremendously success. The, the gentleman from Malaysia who, who bought the park eventually and sold the land and made $500 million, he's not upset. So, yeah, Roberta. Question for you, Keith. You run a very busy company, and you and Jack did it for years, and now you're doing that. Yet I know you so well, and you give so much of your time and your resources to the Themed Entertainment Association in Tiapa. So what, why, why do you do that? Why do you go out and do that? We love that you do that. But give us a little bit of insight for the, the why behind that. Well, the, 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 I'll give you a why and a how. The why is because I owe it to you all. Look at what you've let me do. <laughs> the how is because of a group who's sitting back there and a number of other people in Cincinnati, some of whom are on a plane coming here right now, because they run the company. I don't run the company. You know, the company owns my house, or the bank owns my house, maybe not everybody else's. But the, the TEA, I believed in it. You bludgeoned me to death in 1991 to join. <laughs> we did. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it, 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 Roberta wouldn't let me go until I gave her a check. Um, but, you know, what a ride that was for all those years. We, you know, we grew up together in this business. But I, I feel an obligation, not a debt, but an obligation to, if I can give something back, I will. Um, you know, the, this industry has allowed me to see the world. It allowed me to meet my wife. It allowed me to meet my partner. My daughters were both born in wonderful places. Um, one of whom, Chloe, works with me every day. She has to deal with me all the time, poor thing. Um, but no, I, it's not a, I just do it because I want to and I think I should. And the, it didn't really help any more complicated than that. So, where else? Yeah, Louis. Hi, Keith, how are you? Good. Um, congratulations, by the way. Thank you so uh, much. I'm, I'm moved by what you're talking about because 30 years ago, uh, it was people like you and Bob Ward and other Lifetime Achievement members that really made our industry. When you were swimming those laps, there was no themed entertainment right. industry. You have created uh, a legacy 
for people to follow, which we've all benefited from. And uh, you have my deepest respect for that. Thank you. I'm curious, now your, your efforts are becoming more and more international. You're, you're working all over the world. And you go at it with this American vision of themed entertainment. How do you see carrying that vision, or how do you shape that vision into one that is more globally oriented? I'd just like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. One thing that I meant to mention going through, and I, I didn't, and I think I probably owe this to my mom. I don't really think American, international, whatever. I just, the, the guests like to have a good time. We provide them with the opportunity to have a good time. The one thing I have learned through the years is when we're anywhere other than here, remember you're a guest in somebody else's house. Whether it's the Middle East or Russia or China or whatnot, the people there, they want to be entertained. Many of them didn't have the opportunity. And look, how many of us are working in the Middle East right now? You know, in 1969, there was no Middle East. You know, the, the country's what, hell of a lot younger than I am. Um, but I, I don't, oftentimes we'll get accused of being Americans but that's because of my passport or my business card or my address. But from an entertainment industry standpoint, we've not done very much entertainment work in the United States in the last 20 years. It's all been international. But the, the idea is we kind of grew out of the movies. The movies are international. Yes, there's Bollywood. Yes, there's the Chinese industry. But the guests want an escape. Or they want to be entertained. Or they want to have fun. Or they want to do something together. And I think that's universal. Not Obviously not universal as we know it. But I think it's universal. So I never really go into anything with an attitude other than trying to learn what it is they would like us to do and to do it as well as we possibly can and use what we've learned as the technical support for the story that we're trying to tell for them. Don't tell our story, tell their story. But we have the knowledge base on how to do it. And that, that's moving around the world rapidly, obviously no bigger spot than Shanghai right now where many, many of you are working. Or, or the Middle East where, you know, every other day they announce another theme park. But the, it's, it's their stories that we're telling, unless some of them want our stories. But we use our knowledge base to support those. Um, I, got a, I had a question a couple of weeks ago. I was with uh, David and Paul and we were in Northern Finland at a SAIT conference. I got the question from a young man. And if you guys are in the room, you can help me. If, it was a, the question about the digital aspects. You know, when do I think the digital stuff is going to replace what we do? And I commented, I said, well, I used the Grand Canyon story. I said, well, it's never going to replace that, ever. The digital aspect is a tool. What we do is a tool. It's their story we tell. We just know how to tell it better because they haven't learned how yet. But so I, yes, I have an American accent. I speak no other languages than Midwestern English. Um, but you read the body language. The body language is the same everywhere. You know, I like it or I don't. Yes or no or whatever. But the smile tells the story. Okay. So I can. 
Hello. Oh, it's working. It just wasn't close enough. Uh, oh, Keith, I, I don't know you personally, but I work for uh, Larry White, who's a, a yeah. good friend of yours. and so Former I, partner. Yeah, and so he's, he's I, I've heard stories, and I, he's followed a similar path as you through uh, Cincinnati and all that. Um, we, we have plenty of opportunities seeing this, this industry grow from just, you know, theme parks to all, all kinds of venues now, to entertainment, to memorials, to exhibits. What, my question is, what, uh, where do you think, or what do you think the industry can do next? What more, where do you see that we can influence the world next? <laughs> Not talking about elections or anything like that. Or... <laughs> Uh, no, by the way, the wall in China did not keep people from conquering one another. Um, <laughs> sorry. Couldn't help it. <laughs> Just couldn't help it. Um, <clears throat> where are we going to go next? Well, I, th I, think, I don't think your question is geographic, is it? It's content. Geographically, the answer is pretty easy. There are other worlds that are not yet there. You know, whether it's the, after the ruble comes back, there's going to be a lot more work in Russia. India, sooner or later, is going to come around because, um, hell, they've got a bigger movie industry than we do. The other industries that I think... Let's knock off the museums and the brands and the theme parks and so forth and so on. But you know, maybe I better stick to the geography because I'm not, I don't have the crystal ball. We, we have more and more, not of the same stuff, but an automobile company like Volkswagen took a leap in the year 2000 and developed the Autostadt. Another automobile company that primarily is red took another incredible leap in 2010. There's a Japanese automobile company that unfortunately left Cincinnati within the last six months and is moving to Frisco, Texas. They're taking a further leap. Kind of the evolution of those things. The children's museums have always been popular and then someone came along and did Kidzania that won a, a Thea Award, I think in 2001. And they are kind of taking on the world. I think they're on number certainly in the 20s, it's probably 22, 23. I had the uh, pleasure of being with Javier a couple of weeks ago in Mexico City, and, and I went up to reintroduce myself, and I happened to be the one who had given him the Thea. And he immediately knew me, was thrilled, and wanted to talk about the industry and how excited they were. So people are taking what it is that you all have created and applying them in different areas and I, the horizon, I, I don't know how far away the horizon is. You know, I, years ago, would somebody have said, hey, is branding a good idea? Well, one of the greatest brands in the world, probably the greatest brand in the world, is Coke. They, we, you know, we had the luxury of working with them in Atlanta a number of years ago when they redid the world of Coca-Cola. And I know they're going through some expansion again. But I remember visiting the world of Coke when it was in the underground. You know, that was probably in the 80s. Maybe even, hell, it might have been the 70s. I can't remember. When was it? Was it? 90? Okay, but anyway, so you know, they're evolving and getting better and better and better and bigger. And I think that's about the leap I can make other than geography because I just, not that I don't want to be wrong, but I'm not sure I can even guess. So... Who else? Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> well, actually, you know, Craig, they, I don't sleep in the cab, but it, Patty and I used to go shopping when we lived in Toronto. She had a favorite store, and as you know, my wife likes to buy clothes. And we used to go shopping to this one place in the Eaton Center. And it was great. And we shopped there for a year before I ever took a hat off. And just in case anybody knows, there's nothing there. <laughs> and I either will blind you, or I will get cold, or I will get sunburned. That's why I wear the hat. 
It's, you know, yes, it has become a trademark, but it's also, there's a utilitarian nature to the hats. You know, the sunburns are bother, and I do get cold. It is true. You lose 95% of your body heat through your head. And so, but I do have a collection. Actually, on my 50th birthday, the only way you got to my house was to bring a baseball cap. So, and that, uh, <laughs> so, anyone else? No? Well, I hope you found some of that interesting. Patty said you might because nobody knows the history before JRA. And uh, I certainly thank you for letting me do this. I um, appreciate everything you've done. I hope to see you all on Saturday night because there, there, there are a number of other people who actually need thanks that they will receive those thanks on, uh, on, on, the, uh, on Saturday night. One of whom, is a very special one, is Patty. And she just couldn't be here because she's working. <laughs> you know, she's choreographing. And uh, she is missing rehearsal to come out. So that lets you know how important she thinks this is. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.